Many of you have seen me today and this week already. I'm Anna. I am a stablecoin maxi at Solana Foundation. <laughs> and these are the people I work with. So it is my pleasure to introduce Alex, who is the founder of Stable Corp. Um, the really much the only functional and the best Canadian stablecoin <laughs> um, multi-chain and also on Solana live this year. My friend Alexander, founder of VNX, uh, issuer of tokenized, issuer of Euro, dollars, Euro stablecoin, Swiss franc stablecoin, as well as tokenized gold, gold and maybe many other precious metals to come. He showed me pictures of vaults in, uh, in Liechtenstein. There are a lot of gold bars there. <laughs> um, and then there's Kento, who's the founder of UXD, a really innovative stablecoin on Solana, not backed by traditionally as those stablecoins are, but an interesting design that I'll let him share more about in a second. And then there's Yuso from um, Membrane Finance, uh, which is our first Euro stablecoin, and I'm really excited to say, we were just checking like Etherscan and Soulscan earlier, that we have more holders of Euro stablecoins on Solana than Ethereum for EURC and EUR, Euro E, uh, almost combined. So we're, we're close to 3,400 holders there, and it's off to a great start. So with that, I'll, I'll let you guys maybe introduce a little bit about the mechanisms of your stable coins, and then we can, the panel is very open to being interactive, feel free to raise your hands, but roughly it's going to be about how can we make all of these different stable coins work together, complementary. I don't think it's a, it's a zero sum gain, I think it's like we're on the pie together. And then the second part, we'll be talking about the different use cases, um, some tips and some of our, our hopes for builders here. And the last part will be for uh, regulatory, <laughs> back to the previous panel of like, what, what will regulation look like? Um, so yeah, with that, would you like to start? Amazing, yes, thanks so much for, for having us, thanks for moderating all of this fun stuff, and I like the way you described it as these are the people that I work with, because <laughs> I mean, the way that the global stablecoin game gets won is all of us creating fabric together where our coins are interoperable, you know, we're all in the same networks, we all have the same payment rails, uh, you know, we all have the same regulatory environments, so somebody's tokenized security is not somebody else's e-money. Um, so QCAD specifically, the, the digital dollar that we, that we issue out of Canada is fully fiat reserved, it's you know, as, as boring as it comes. Uh, which is kind of where you know, the, the world and the market is today. There's a ton of really innovative, interesting, potential other ways to you know, grow and scale the stablecoin market. Um, but in sort of the, uh, the, the global standard of, of fiat backed, we're as, as vanilla as it comes. Um, and I think we focus a lot on, again, that currency interoperability. So on chain FX, push to cards, uh, ATM machines, being able to convert to cash. So all those things that make it really, really usable and really, really spendable, not just in Canada, but around the world as well. Hello, my name is uh, Alexander. I'm the founder of uh, VNX. VNX is a, a stablecoin uh, issuer generator based in Liechtenstein. We actually have two platforms, one in Liechtenstein, one in uh, Luxembourg. We're regulated in respective con uh, countries and we're issuing uh, uh, Euro stablecoin, Swiss franc and gold. Um, so pretty similar in that sense to Paxos, but regulated in uh, Europe. And um, the focus for us, we're pretty fresh on this market from this year onwards. Uh, we're coming on Solana in literally uh, weeks. Uh, the token contract's been deployed, but the launch will be in a few weeks. And uh, we're looking forward to work with the community to create use cases, especially for the institution interacting with the retail and, um, you know, hopefully we will be a big help to the Solana community. Hi, uh, my name is Kento Inami. I'm the founder of UXD Protocol. Uh, UXD Protocol is a decentralized stablecoin that's pegged to the US dollar. Uh, we've been out for quite a long time, at least in, in terms of like Solana years. So uh, I started working on this project since 2021. We launched in early 2022 um, and uh, yeah, it's been live for now 18 months. Um, and basically, uh, the difference between decentralized stable coins and centralized stable coins is obviously that it's decentralized and how we do it is that basically we have a governance token and governance token holders can vote uh, on, can make proposals and vote on, the, on these proposals to make changes to the stable coin um, and to kind of, uh, you know, make the stable coin better. Um, I'll probably talk more in detail about the stable coin later, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the, uh, 
rough explanation for uh, UXD. Yeah, I'm Yuzo, head of product and, and growth at Membrane Finance. We are building a Euro stablecoin that's currently issued on five chains. We're also coming to a few others this year. And our focus is on trying to be as boring as possible. So we try to do things as far as we can by the book. So we are regulated as an electronic money institution in Finland. Our license has been passported to all EU and EEA countries. And to my knowledge, we're the only Mika compatible EU based stablecoin at the moment. So our angle is really much on, on ensuring that we have good banking connectivity, we have a good regulatory status, um, our token or euro can be considered in accounting and taxation, etc. purposes as nearly as, as cash can be. So that the enterprise movement from the current old school banking system to blockchain based financial systems can happen in a more easier way. We also provide some APIs for interoperability. So that's kind of our focus, trying to be as boring as possible. Thanks. Um, so I talked a bit about the history of money on uh, Tuesday, um, but I think money can exist in many different shapes and forms. I have my own views, but curious to hear what you guys think. How will your stablecoin exist alongside um, other forms of money? In no, in no particular order, and <laughs> we can have a yeah, okay. it's, a, it's a great question. I think it leads a little bit into kind of the, you know, the CBDC versus what a digital fiat is existing. What, you know, what is PayPal setting aside PYUSD? You know, what, what is Wise really doing with mm -hmm. a, you know, a digital version of money? And, and in many ways, you know, this is a, you know, an open source way of filling in digitization on top of a banking system that can no longer innovate or, or improve itself. So it, it, why is a great example of a whole bunch of currencies that sit in accounts in different countries and never move, but they have this closed loop system that sits on top and just moves credits around, but you, know, you can never leave that closed loop world. Stable coins are not that dissimilar, where the fiat reserves sit in different countries and never move, but we've created this open source, incredibly interactive, open world uh, uh, um, ecosystem of the actual tokens that can trade on DEXs, that can you know, go in a million different ways that something like a WISE cannot. So I think it's really an expansion and an evolution of that form of money that we have right now, where TradFi sort of run out of ways to innovate. We're just in V0.1 of uh, the ways that we can innovate with digital money. Yeah. I feel like TradFi is innovating like the way we try to innovate on text messages and phone calls, and then now we're building like Telegram. Uh, but also, of course, an important uh, uh, aspect is uh, uh, transfers between different countries or transfers between people. Um, uh, you know, especially here in Europe, uh, uh, not many people remember before euro, but uh, if you try to transfer between Swiss franc and euro or euro and uh, British pound, the fees are 2-3%. If you try to send money to, for example, Dubai, especially in euro, it could be even higher. But uh, with stable coins, it's 0, 0.0, especially if you go through DeFi. So it, I think it's a very, very important uh, factor of getting the friction out of the payments, be it cross-border payments, peer-to-peer -peer payments. So yes, I think we are a very, very complementary but at the same time smoothing the system. Yeah, um, I also think that like uh, stablecoins will coexist with the digital financial structure. Um, for example, like, uh, like for payments, for example, uh, an easy way to use stablecoins for payments is through actually credit cards or debit cards where you hold your stablecoin in your wallet or some custodial account and then when you spend with a debit card, it deducts the, the, you know, the stablecoin from your account. And you know, there's like these uh, crypto credit companies that where you put your USDC in, you earn yield on it during the time it's, it stays there. So you already kind of see this, you know, this connection between you know, TradFi and, 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 and crypto already. Um, and it's really helpful for people like me because you know, um, I travel a lot and it's, uh, it's kind of difficult for me to get like, bank accounts. So this kind of system really helps me um, you know, make payments. So I think it's, you already kind of see this uh, connection. Yeah, when, when I think about stable coins, I think about the feature sets of different types of money. So broadly, we have cash, which is a central bank issued money. We have bank deposits. Then we have various forms of cards. Now we have stable coins. And then we also have this extension of CBDCs, which from a European perspective is going to be a digital version of cash. So there will be holding limits. It will not be programmable, et cetera. So when you think about the features of these different currencies, cash is peer to peer, right? None of the others are, except for stable coins. They are peer to peer. None of those are programmable. They are all in their own closed system loop ecosystems. For example, a European uh, CBDC will be a closed system. Cash cannot really be 
program truly. There are like vending machines where you can use it, sure. But stable coins provide a new feature set that has not been available previously, which is programming. So when you can kind of pair internet age with blockchain and make programmable transactions, there's a lot of new use cases that emerge, for example, in invoicing for smart city interactions or AI data loads. It just opens up a new way of monetizing businesses and henceforth also a new venue for businesses to innovate and operate in. Can I just make one more quick point? Um, just we tried unbundling banks like 10 or 15 years ago, and I feel like that was sort of the dawn of the fintech, maybe like closer to 20 years ago at this point. And eventually banks just sort of ended up slowly gobbling things back up, or like banks you know, ended up you know, doing 90% of the work. This really is an opportunity to actually unbundle payments from banks for the first time you know, since we had like Scrip or when cash was kind of actually king. Uh, so it will work in, in consistent. Banks will always have a place in the value stack, but it's one of the first times we've actually had an opportunity to truly unbundle, which is really cool. Yeah, for sure. I guess throwing out a wild idea here is that we're kind of building out stable coins on top of another layer of banking infrastructure. And unless right now you're a CBDC or like central banks working on digital currencies or some other oftentimes like government-related institution or agency, it's very hard. It is right now, unless you want to store a bunch of cash in a vault, impossible to separate ourselves from the banking, banking system. So I wonder if in the future, like UXD or some other iterations of stable coins, will come up with ways to, to be fully, not just another layer on top of the banking system, but fully separated. Actually, side note, some stablecoin issuer back in the like two cycles ago, legit had vaults and vaults of cash, and that was their way of issuing stablecoins. I don't think people will do that anymore, um, but just something interesting in, in the past of uh, crypto history. So my next question is, how do you guys think the licensed, compliant stablecoins like the three of you here would interact with like the UXDs of the world. Um, I was half expecting you guys to get in a debate of what stable coins <laughs> would be on the backstage, but everyone's very friendly. friendly so I, know, I think uh, we can have this conversation here. Yeah, I mean, I, I always think about it sort of in terms of, of evolution and development, right? Like we, I think we've, we've both said a couple times that like fiat backed stable coins are, are boring and sort of designed <laughs> to be boring, right? They're designed to take you know, a lot of the risk out and just extend the technology of you know, a, a framework that we already have today of moving money around, having digital dollars, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's sort of like, you know, that's theoretically ready to scale today. You know, the regulations have started to catch up there. Like, we're pretty confident on what we need to do to, like, you know, create stability. Obviously, you know, it still depegs every once in a while with USDC. Um, and, you know, non-fiat-backed, non whether it's, you know, algorithmic, decentralized, all of those things are, yeah, they're, they're ready to scale for different use cases. And they're just a different, I won't even call it a different stage of evolution, but a, a different stage of, of sort of experimentation. And there's way more upside in a lot of ways from those types of models. I mean, if you think about gold-backed fiat to un-gold-backed fiat, it's kind of, you know, there's a big step of efficiency when we sort of got rid of the gold peg. And you know, that's almost like what we're trying to look at here is what, what are the other models that can unbundle it even further from banking? So I don't think they're, they're competitive. I think they're sort of at different stages of the product evolution and made for different things. I absolutely agree with that. Um, there's also different features that are available in some of these assets. So for example, in Europe, uh, with markets and crypto as a regulation, a stablecoin cannot pay out interest, whereas this might be possible within DeFi in a DeFi stablecoin. And for those more advanced users, DeFi-based stablecoins can then provide a feature set that is not available in the traditional, traditional stablecoin space. And these features, while they are available for advanced users and they may be a bit more prone to risks, for example, they're available, and that availability is super important, and it's, it's good that we have these alternatives, even though they might not be serving the same kind of a user base or, or, or use cases. Uh, just uh, to come back on your previous point about how it can interact with the dollars and with the banks, we are actually one of the few players who do issue stable coins backed by precious metals. And precious metals are held in the vaults, but they're not within the banking system. And what we see is that uh, there is a specific interest from asset managers or uh, like trusts and foundations, especially that have gone through uh, many, many years of holding the assets or caring for the assets, who do want to have a certain proportion of their assets outside of the banking sector. 
And that, I think, is one of the possibilities to look at it, that there will be different stable coins. Of course, the majority, this is my assumption, would be connected to the reserves which are held in the traditional financial institutions. But yes, there will be some demand for the assets which are held outside. Uh, yeah, I mean, not much to add, but, you know, uh, so I work on a decentralized stablecoin, um, and obviously even decentralized stablecoins are not above, above the law, right? So uh, there's, like, these things that you should, like, almost never do, and then the things that you, you know, can do, and it's very difficult centralized stable coins are the things that I, I think most decentralized stablecoins tries to do, and we also try to take that approach. But also at the same time, you're very careful, especially regarding like US regulations, because I think that's like the most uh, the risky area that, you know, that we just don't want to take risks. Yeah. And, and you could argue that some, a, sta a fiat-backed stablecoin that's actually backed 100% with treasury bills is kind of outside the banking system already. I mean, Tether is up uh, to 86% yeah, yeah. of treasury bills, and, and you know, it's, it's not sort of tethered to that, or tethered, um, shackled to that uh, banking system as well. Yeah. Uh, question, uh, I think one of the original questions was how, how we interact with decentralized <laughs> stablecoins. Um, for us as a regulated entity, that's super hard, unfortunately. So yeah. we cannot really do anything on the secondary markets. Uh, we only mint to redeem euro. So for the in, for us, the interaction is like it's it's not there, mm -hmm. and that's why there are secondary markets. That's why there are people with their own incentive structures, and these are still applications that DeFi protocols can build in terms of like yield farming, whatever. Um, these are applications that are being built in DeFi and not so much in the traditional finance space. So there's definitely a lot of use cases there that we cannot really touch, but are still being expanded and built upon by decentralized stablecoin alternatives. Well, and that's a great point on DeFi as well. Like that's sort of the great um, you know, connecting agent, right? Like a regulated stablecoin and an unregulated stablecoin can trade basically atomically for you know, almost zero. Um, and you can build that into the back end of payment structures, right? Like you want to do a regulated payment, go nuts. You want to earn yields, you know, we're all within the same framework. You can swap back and forth between these different kinds of structures that offer different things. Yeah, I think if anything, the interaction lies in the fiat on off ramp side. Um, at least that's the minimal that you, you can compliantly interact with. But another thing is that even stablecoin issuers between each other have been building relationships at Breakpoint, learning how to use the other, account, the other issuers' banking networks to maximize their on off ramp region. So that, for example, Stablecore has banking relationships in Canada, and then Alexander has banking relationships in Europe. And now you can actually on off ramp in both of these places if both stablecoins are on Solana. Um, so that's a really cool one of the use cases. Um, next, I think everyone here, if you've touched Solana DeFi, have asked this question or wondered, um, how can we bootstrap liquidity? So what are, I was wondering what are any examples that we can study from history to even like figure out if, if there are things we can learn from, such as when Europe, uh, the EU, went from individual currencies to to the euro, if you guys want to comment on that, or just like um, how in Web3 you've seen um, stablecoins been able to bootstrap that yeah. equity. I think there's a perfect example of when the European area came together for their own currency. They had to build a lot of trust. There was a new currency, nobody knew what it was. They had to embark on a mission of building trust. And that's still definitely the case for especially fiat-backed stablecoins. Not so much for decentralized stablecoins because they can show the reserves on chain. That's a different process. But for centralized stable coins, building trust, ensuring that that trust factor is there, getting that right is super important. Um, that's one of the primary drivers for our focus on regulatory um, compliance. And by that compliance and that kind of a stamp of approval from your national competent authority, there's a certain level of trust ingrained in that. And that's super important. Other ways are, of course, secondary market peg. So ensuring the one euro is always one euro, that's extremely important. But unfortunately, as we come to the regulatory side of things, that's a thing that's much harder for us. So we cannot ourselves really influence the secondary markets. We do have a minting a redemption mechanism that allows you to basically move any amount of liquidity from the traditional financial system to the blockchain and vice versa. And we hope that can bring some trust elements into the game. But for decentralized stables, I think the conversation might be slightly different. Um, yeah, I mean, as you said, like for decentralized stablecoins, at least like the safety can be kind of verified if it's open source. You can check and you can see that the collateral uh, is in there. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit different, I guess, in that respect. 
Go ahead. Um, I think for, for, for us, the key driver um, has been adoption of Mika. So uh, suddenly, European Union that has been lagging uh, in the blockchain development for the last four years or five years, um, whenever I uh, used to come to the conference and explain what we're doing, everyone was like, yeah, come on. <laughs> who's interested in it, so, suddenly we became like the, one of the hottest people to, to speak to. So I think this has for sure pushed um, European blockchain and crypto industry to the center uh, of the global kind of crypto and blockchain industry. Again, we're quite new, therefore I think the key is to grab as much space as it is possible with real use cases, which are payments, which are uh, transfers between different countries. So something where people can really feel that they are gaining. They're gaining in terms of saving their money from inflation. If these are people in the countries with weak, fi weak financial systems, uh, either they're gaining on the fees by transferring the money. So this, I think, is the key for us to develop. We really hope to, um, to, to, to bring these use cases, to utilize the uh, Solana blockchain network to you know, spread those cases across the globe. But I think eventually this uh, foundational layer of Mika would be really helping all of us in order to bring this uh, into the kind of proper way forward. Yeah, and, and I think we all agree that stable coins are going to be a lot larger in five years from now than they are today. And I think you know, we've had this concept of like on-chain FX, and everybody's like, oh, no-brainer, it's such a you know, terrible world to send money around right now. It costs me a ton when I tap my credit card in a different country. Like, there, there's so many things that are just sort of make so much sense around this, but why hasn't it happened yet? And you know, non-USD stable coins represent like 0.1% of the market cap and like 0% you know, of the volume. And you know, just, just being transparent about sort of where we are in, in the scale of all of this. And what's really interesting about sort of the, you know, from here to then, and, and back to the Euro example, we're not creating a new currency here, right? Like all you really need to get liquidity into a non-USD uh, coin is you know, one, one or two players that really trust it. And with, you know, with new uh, concentrated liquidity mechanics and things like that, like, and for the size of payments that are generally going around, I mean, with 100K on, on Orca or Uniswap V3, sorry, dirty word around here, um, but that you can, you can do 5K of, of USD to QCAD for like five basis points in slippage. Like you do not need a ton of liquidity to create the ability to do transactions at a price point that is you know, 90 to 95% less expensive than TradFi. And you, you only need a couple of global institutions to really buy that, okay, you know, not everybody may know, you know, a, a smaller issuer, but if, you know, a, a, a Cumberland or a, a, our, our friends DV in, in the audience here, if there's a large market maker that has that faith that they can go one for one, the liquidity can grow into something that's really substantial and meaningful basically overnight. To, just to, just to, to piggyback on Alexander's point, it's really that last mile where, sure, I can swap between these two you know, digital versions of assets for two basis points, but you know, when I'm traveling in the US still, like you know, when, when I'm buying Arby's or whatever on a road trip, like, I'm still paying four or 5% on, on my, you know, my MasterCard. So it, it's that last mile of figuring out whether it's car card pushes, ATMs, all of those things. Um, and you don't necessarily need to build a ton of trust around the asset itself if you have the right partners, the right phenomenal infrastructure like what you know, Solana can bring to the table. And then that last mile, you can almost bury that and just focus on the cost savings. And I think that's really what's going to win this game. In the interest of time, I'm curious, anyone here who's looking for ideas to build? And we can dive into that. Otherwise, we can jump into some other use cases. If you're looking for use cases, raise your hand. All right. OK. <laughs> then we can talk a little bit about, I was thinking, because each one of you have kind of told me one or two like, pretty interesting use cases and maybe unique to, to your, um, your deal pipeline or relationships. If you're willing to share some, it'd be great to hear from you. Like, What is the m most interesting use case you've seen so far? Yes. Uh, so we, we care about um, you know, two, two kind of key things. And students and international students moving around are, are sort of a key target market of ours. Um, so what, what we've built, so we actually have a, a credit card integration in Canada. So you can go um, from Orca, like USDC to QCAD for five basis points, and then zero cost from a non-custodial wallet right to a spendable card that shows up on your, on your Apple Pay. 
Um, and so being able to have university students who are, you know, have, have their general money in a different part of the world, but are studying and spending and, and kind of living temporarily in Canada, that's a huge use case for us because none of them are large enough to really be getting like institutional rates and they're sending money frequently in small chunks. Um, and they're generally you know, younger and more tech savvy and, and able to sort of go through this process. Um, so, so spending like actual spendable cash. The other thing that we, we pay a lot of attention to or prioritize is being able to pay tuition directly from stable coins. So we built an integration with bill pay in Canada. So you can pay tuition, you can pay your, your visa bill, you can pay property taxes all without needing to have that interim hop of off-ramping into your own bank account. Effectively, you know, it's a checking account that you can initiate everything from digital assets and then have that fiat settle into the last mile of where you want it without needing to have that banking layer. So a lot of, you know, that, that has a lot of applicability broadly, but students is a big place that we focus. Um, what we saw is uh, a difficulty of um, uh, young companies, especially from the blockchain and crypto to open bank accounts. Basically, banks in Europe uh, are reluctant to deal with small companies where they don't see a lot of fees and see a lot of hassle, especially if these companies come from blockchain and crypto. So uh, we tried to address it, and uh, um, the trade uh, companies and trade uh, uh, registry in uh, Liechtenstein recently approved uh, payment of the capital, initial capital for company formation in VNX stablecoins. So VNX Euro or VNX CHF can be uh, used in order to set up companies, and I think. This is one of the you know, very clear advantages for um, uh, for the companies when they're coming to the air, uh, co coming to be. Uh, that's all. Uh, so I think like so far, stablecoins have mostly been used in as collateral to trade derivatives on sexes and then to earn yield in DeFi. So I think these two have been the main use cases for stablecoins, um, but the you know, what, what they are, are is kind of like speculation kind of based uh, activities. And I think the next, you know, big thing or that will uh, bring, you know, people outside of crypto into crypto and use stable coins is like actual real use cases like payments, uh, payrolls and, and streaming, which don't have like a, a speculative element. Um, but people just want to use it to, to do their everyday things. Um, so I think that will like make the market much bigger. So that's what I'm kind of excited for, for stable coins. I'm going to mention just a few very short use cases. So these are around the stuff that is not possible with the current banking system. So one of the use cases that we have seen you already getting implemented in is smart city applications, for example. So whenever you take your electric vehicle, you drive it, you park it somewhere, you can just walk out. It automatically charges for every second that you park on the parking spot and for every kilowatt that you charge your car. No need for anything else. Your car has its own wallet, automatically pays the system. Stuff like that. Not possible in traditional finance. Only possible in Solana. Can I add one more? Awesome. Um, Short-term financing, buy now, pay later, supply chain finance. Even if they have T plus one settlement and there's no international money movement required, just adding in an additional day of interest earning when the total length of your loan is like eight days or something like that is a huge interest savings for a lot of these companies that are operating in that structure. So we, we built basically an API where uh, you can have fiat live entirely around the edge and then create you know, entirely stable coin based structures of commerce in the middle. It's like instant credit granting, instant transaction, instant settlement, instant loan fulfillment, um, and just have that interest calculation happen the, at the second that it needs to happen. And stuff like that, again, do to your point, is just things you cannot do with the traditional banking system today. Yeah, for sure. All right, last question, rapid fire. What do you think your stable coins should be called, and who do you think should regulate it? <laughs> Sorry? What do you think your token or stable coin or e-money or whatever it should be called, and who should regulate it? A digital dollar and the Bank of Canada. Uh, VNX Euro, VNX Swiss franc, and respective uh, countries where it's regulated. Wait, should it be held? Is the question? What, should it be called a stable coin or a stable token? Or? Oh, yeah, it's, it's stable coin. Yeah. Stable coin is fine. Yeah. All right, sounds good. All right, thank you guys for coming.